Hello friends and family. Welcome to our boring meditation stuff for Thursday, October 8th. It is my dad's birthday, so happy birthday dad if you're watching this. Um, and today we get to the, the juicy part of this sutta and the confusing part of this sutta. It is difficult for people to um, appreciate sometimes why we wouldn't be gunning for the bright side of the spectrum exclusively. So we have the spectrum between dark and bright, um, and it's, it's possible to move between them. So why don't we just try to live our lives on the bright side? Um, this fourth category is, uh, is a somewhat paradoxical in the sense that it is described as an action. It is described as kamma, karma, but it is the karma, the kamma, which destroys other kamma. It is the action which destroys action. What does that mean? <laughs> so within the scope of this sutta, it is not explained, um, but it is described elsewhere. Elsewhere it is descri described as the Noble Eightfold Path. So um, these different components of the path, what is the path? Ultimately, the path is Vipassana meditation, according at least to the Vipassana tradition. Um, the path is described in many other forms of literature in frustratingly incomplete ways, um, much in the same way that this sutta describes it. And one of my favorite <laughs> is the Tao Te Ching. And for a long time, I tried to understand what does this mean? The Tao Te Ching repeatedly emphasizes the value, the merit, the virtue of non-action. Not no action, but non-action. And I couldn't understand that idea at all. I couldn't understand, oh, okay, non-action. What does that mean? Actions tend to be doing things moving around, saying things, as we've discussed. External actions are the, the actions which are easy to see. They are the actions which are easy to understand and which have consequences which are easy to understand. For a period, I was confused enough with this idea that I actually um, mixed up We covered early on in this, this week's list of videos um, this idea that there's a spectrum and that spectrum has on one end uh, self-indulgence, right? Um, satisfying cravings, hedonism, and I mean, modern life in general. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's this idea of you know, self-mortification, self-harm, um, and the idea that there's some sort of liberation in uh, the kind of ascetic practices which did take a person to real extremes. And um, for a period, I actually understood this idea of non-action described in the Tao Te Ching in terms of... Uh, this 
kind of hedonism, a sort of very particular kind of hedonism, just laziness, right? Oh, okay, it was just, I don't do anything. I lie on the floor, I go outside and I stare at the sky and I relax. I try to do nothing. Um, and some people will actually tell you that this is a meditation practice. Oh, just do nothing. Um, it's not, that's just laziness. That's not really meditating. Um, but it, it really confused me for a while. And so I can really appreciate why it is confusing to others, particularly um, coming to this sutta, maybe without other literary background and similar ideas. So at that age, I was also reading Seneca, Stoic. Um, and these, these two ideas came into conflict, right? It, it seemed as though the Taoists and the Stoics were arguing for the same thing. But Seneca makes a very extreme, specific example. He says there are people who have so much luxury, have so much ease, so much privilege, such a high status in society that they can just they can behave however they want, and if they want to become an absolute slug, they can. And so this person is, um, in his example, is being carried around. Um, so four people on the, the four poles, and they're, um, they're carrying this person, like palaquin or, or whatever they're called. Um, and this person meets someone, they're supposed to meet someone, and the person being carried, the question he or she asks is, am I sitting down? Um, which is indicative of a, a sort of laziness and complacency and self-indulgence, like just far beyond um, what I think any of us really know. Um, essentially, almost in a state of non-being, right? Like, I don't even know what state my body is in. Um, oh, I'm so relaxed. I'm just, I'm indulging in <laughs> the ultimate in laziness. Um, and I, I conflated that state, which Seneca ridicules, um, with non-action as it is described in the Tao Te Ching. It's not really described in the Tao Te Ching. It's just said non-action. This is a virtuous non-action. And so if we go back to our, our clean room, our laboratory, our sandbox, our place for experimentation, our eyes are closed, our mouth is closed. We are not moving. There is no external action available to us. Everything that we're doing is internal. How do we act? We can only act under these circumstances by reacting. We can only have an image materialize in our mind and, and it becomes concrete and reified and we respond to it. Either this is this is a beautiful image, so I respond with craving. This is a horrible image. This is a person I hate, so I respond with hatred and anger. Whatever the case, right? But these responses live on this spectrum that was drawn out earlier, the simplified spectrum. And the simplified spectrum is uh, darkness on one side and brightness on the other side. And these categories, these two broad categories, are very easy to see when we're trying to follow our breath. <laughs> we sit there and, okay, I'm going to follow my breath, and I follow a few breaths, and then I start thinking about the politicians, and I start worrying for the future of humanity. I start thinking about someone who said something rude to me the other day. I start thinking about some work I need to do. And maybe I'm feeling 
either craving or aversion to the work I need to do, or both, right? There's also this mixed bag category of I'm simultaneously feeling two sort of opposing things, but it's still a reaction. And non-action in this clean room, in this sandbox, in our lab of meditation is to not react. I don't get sucked in. I don't get drawn away. I don't get distracted. I stay with the breath or the body if you're doing Vipassana. I stay with the breath and I'm in this one spot. It's narrow, it's focused, and I'm not reacting. I may react momentarily, but I draw myself back away from the reaction. I don't also, I don't create another reaction, right? Oh, a beautiful image appeared. Oh, I'd really like some chocolate right now. <laughs> oh, I really need chocolate. Oh, maybe after I meditate, I'll go have some chocolate. Do we have chocolate in the fridge? Maybe I need to go to the store and get chocolate. If I get upset that I've started thinking about chocolate, now I'm reacting to my reaction, right? That's not the goal. The goal is just to bring the attention back. Oh, okay. Lead the donkey back to the pole, right? Tie the rope a little tighter. Try again. Stay at the pole, donkey. And the donkey will wander off, and then you bring the donkey back. You train yourself not to react. Now, what is confusing about this is that our external actions, all these actions that we described as being dependent on our internal action, our volition, our external actions will never be this, right? Okay, not never. There is a kind of hypothetical case <laughs> um, where we've won the Arhant, the Buddha, right? That is who this person is. Their external actions, every word they say, every act, every step they take is perfect. They do not react. They only behave perfectly, externally. If you want to believe in that, go ahead. But this isn't, a, this isn't really a useful category of behaviors to try to aspire to. Oh, I need to, I need to behave like a Buddha. No, you don't, right? Um, this is too high a bar to set. The bar that we're setting for ourselves is within meditation. And that's a high bar. It is the bar of not reacting. It is the bar of non-action. It is the bar of doing nothing to some extent. It's not lying on the floor and being lazy. It's not a meditation practice of, I'll just sit there. Just sit. Don't do anything, man. No. I have a meditation object. Without an object, the mind will just go wherever it wants. Then you're just a monkey. But if you have a meditation object, you can hold that meditation object. The tenacity, right? This is work. Meditation is work. To hold the meditation object for as long as possible, continuously, and when you inevitably get distracted, you bring your attention back. This is non-action. And it only exists for us <laughs> beginners in meditation. In the outside world, we are approaching non-action. We are approaching perfect action, as it were. But the approach is through these other categories. And in an earlier video, I described how there's this tendency to want to create a symmetrical dichotomy, right? Dark on one side, light on the other side, or vice versa, 
right? And that's not how it works. The dichotomy is there to some extent. The spectrum is there, but we're looking through it. It goes away from us. And we start with dark. We work our way through dark. So we feel sad. We feel anxious. We feel angry. We feel hatred, right? We feel all sorts of terrible things. We say and do all sorts of terrible things and regret them. And then we move through the light. We think beautiful things. We think healthy things, wholesome things, compassionate things, loving things. And we say and do healthy, wholesome, loving, compassionate actions, concrete external actions. And the thing which is dragging us there <laughs> is non-action, which is hard to appreciate without doing it. That is the whole reason that I am making these videos for everyone, is to encourage you to try. Try non-action. Try non-action within the scope of this simple, simple practice of Anapana meditation. It should drag you through the dark, through the light, and hypothetically make you perfect. <laughs> but, I mean, none of us will see that, right? All we're seeing is, is this other part of this spectrum working for us? Are we moving away from the dark and toward the light? Away from the evil and toward the good. Away from the unwholesome and toward the wholesome. That's the goal. But because we constantly frame our lives in terms of what is external, we're tempted to believe that we can just convince ourselves that this is possible. Oh, I'll just, oh, I'll just stop being a jerk. Oh, I'll just stop being angry all the time. Oh, I'll just stop being sad all the time. And other people will tell people this as well, right? <laughs> like people who've never felt sad in their lives will go to a depressed person and just be like, oh, I'll just stop being depressed. Oh, I'll just stop being sad. Why are you sad all the time? Because that's not how it works, right? Sadness on the outside, anxiety on the outside, anger on the outside originates inside. This is inherent. This is an inherent truth. Your mind is inside this body. It's trapped here. However it works, however your nervous system and your brain and all the other components of whatever makes up your mind are functioning together, they're inside the body. And everything that you express externally begins internally. And so if there exists this spectrum, right? And the spectrum moves away from you, dark to light to perfection. But I mean, again, externally, that's not important. You shouldn't take it for granted that this spectrum exists. You should explore it yourself. The place where you can explore it is meditation. Anyone who's ever said, oh, I, I said an angry thing, right? Oh, I disrespected someone. I regret it. Anyone who's ever told themselves, oh, this action I did, I regret, I won't do it again, knows that's not how it works. You have habits. I have habits. We all have habits. We have these habits. The habits are mental, not physical. I don't have a physical habit of saying rude things. I have a mental habit of thinking rude thoughts, and they come out when they surface, right? That's the, that's the apex. There's nowhere for a thought to go once it's escaped your lips. And this is what the action, which destroys action, is. 
there is a space wherein monastics, right, a monk who's working day in and day out at this practice, sitting in Vipassana meditation constantly, sleeping in Vipassana meditation constantly, um, this person will reach a state where perhaps they supposedly have no dark thoughts, emotions, or actions left in them. They cannot do unwholesome things. Again, supposedly. For that person, the transition is now from lightness to perfection. And I think that we beginners, when we read these suttas, we can get confused. We can get stuck in these ideas meant for monks and nuns, right? <laughs> the idea of the transition from a, a pure-hearted, um, a, a person of, of lightness, of love and infinite love and compassion, to move still forward to perfection, that's not for us. <laughs> It's nice to know that it's there, but th this is not for beginners, lay people um, who are just beginning our meditation practice. Um, and that is most of us, I think. And so I think that this is the root of the confusion. Um, first of all, that we try to think about karma, that we try to think about karma, cause and effect in external terms which is a mistake. Our playground, our laboratory, is our meditation cushion or chair or wherever you meditate. Um, and that is where we should work to understand the suttas, mostly, right? There are suttas which address specifically external action. The Buddha gives advice like, give gifts to your family. <laughs> They'll like that. You're not giving gifts to them in meditation. I mean, maybe you are in terms of metta and things like this, but um, there are times when the thing to be interpreted is almost exclusively external. That's fine. But otherwise, if the sutta, if the advice can be framed in an internal sense, in a meditative sense, it should always be understood that way. And this is actually true of a lot of this sort of literature. Now, when I go back and read the Tao Te Ching, it makes so much more sense to me. I can see it on all these other scales. I can see it in terms of how it pertains to uh, humanity, governments, nation states, um, communities, families, and the individual. But First and foremost, it's talking about meditation. That is the core of the arguments being made in the Tao Te Ching, and they're saying essentially um, the same things that these other forms of literature are saying. Uh, the Stoics, the Hindus, the Christians, the Muslims, the Jains, the different um, sects of Buddhism, Ultimately, they are all saying the same thing, but the difficulty is that it's easiest to see in terms of the effects, right? in terms of the consequences. Um, and you really have to work backward from there. And when you're working backward, you always end up internal. You always end up in uh, an internal state or an assessment of what's going on <laughs> inside here. Um, and the only way to operate on that machinery is meditation. That's, I think that it, I don't think I'm saying anything outlandish there, that there is no other way to do that. Um, there's no magic pill that you can take uh, to correct, fundamentally correct the machinery, right? Um, you can do some work there. <laughs> it's, neuroplasticity is neat, but um, uh, meditation has this sort of go down to the bottom of the ocean and find where is the beginning, 
right? And, okay, now we'll work our way back up. Um, so this is the uh, the end um, of this little video series thing. Um, soon, um, I have uh, maybe one or two more videos regarding this topic, regarding the um, the ideas presented here. I hope that they were relatively clear. Um, if anybody has any questions about anything that I've said here, I realize not everyone has read the uh, Kukurabhattaka Sutta, so it's possible that I've left out some ideas um, uh, or, or I've skipped over things and I've uh, just confused you. So if you um, if you do feel confused by anything that I've said, please go ahead and get in touch with me. I would be happy to throw one more video up and try to clarify them. All right, until tomorrow. I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves and taking good care of everyone around them. I will see you tomorrow to discuss one small warning. All right, goodbye.